Greetings, my name is Lucas Mann, and I pastor the Spring Church here in Lawrence. And I come out here this morning to bring to you the gospel of grace, the good news of Jesus Christ, to share with you the message of life. My friends, the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, for all those who believe it. And so I offer the gospel today, holding forth the message of life that you might believe it and be saved from your sin. For Scripture says that all are born in sin. In fact, the psalmist said in Psalm 51 that in sin did his mother conceive him. And therefore we are born needing salvation. We are born as guilty sinners. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. We must be delivered from the wrath of God. And that only comes through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, my friends, is the centerpiece of the ages. He is the focus of the Gospel. He is the one for whom all things have been made, and through whom all things have been made, and for whose glory they have been made. He is the one who is to be worshipped and to be reverenced. Not simply are we to give Him lip service, but we are to live for Him. For Him who laid down His life for His church, for His people. Christ has a great love for His people. We know in Ephesians 5.25 that Paul the Apostle writes, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. Friends, Christ has loved His bride with a great love. And you ought to allow that love that God has manifested in His Son to move you to embrace Him in faith. Otherwise, there is a fearful expectation of the wrath of God that will consume the enemies of God. And you may be religious. You may have outward trappings of religion in your life. But if you do not have the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ credited to you, you will not see the kingdom of God. If you are not born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. We know from Romans 3.28 that it says we are justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And that's my desire this morning is that you yourselves would be justified by faith apart from the works of the law and that you'd be saved from slavery to sin. You may say, Lucas, why are you preaching in the Bible Belt like this? Most everyone goes to church. Most everyone has prayed and asked Jesus into their heart. Because most people who sit in churches and most people who've prayed a prayer and asked Jesus into their heart are lost. Most people who think they know Christ do not know Him. They're deceived. They're deluded. Jesus said in Matthew 7, there are many on the day of judgment who will say to Me, Lord, Lord. And He will say to them, I never knew you. They knew Him to be Lord. They knew that He was the Sovereign King. They knew that He ruled over creation. Yet He will deny them access into the Kingdom. Because though they claim to have His saving grace in their lives, they do not manifest that grace. In other words, they don't, they don't, live, as, or they don't live in accordance to what they say they believe. They're hypocrites. And you perhaps are one of them. And I love you enough to tell you that the one who loves you the most is the one who tells you the most truth. I'd rather wound you with the truth than comfort you with lies. I could comfort you with lies, but all that will get you is hell. Torment in hell. And instead I want you to enter into glory. To enter into heaven. But not only in the life to come, but I want you also to be made right with God in this life to live for the glory of Christ in this life. And so that's my intention and my desire this morning, to make known the glory of the Gospel, that you might be saved from your sin. And ultimately it is to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, to make known the work of Christ, to preach the Gospel of Christ, is to bring glory to Christ. If you despise the preaching of the Gospel of Christ, I fear for your soul. Because the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news that Christ died for sin and was buried and was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, is precious to the heart of the believer and it glorifies God. 
It is the gospel of the glory of God. So as I preach it, it is my desire that God would be glorified this morning. The text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this morning is found in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 3, in verse 26, verse 26 of Roman chapter, Romans chapter 3, and I want to look at the second half of this verse. And Paul here is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ and how the Father has accomplished salvation for His people through the death of His Son. And he says this in the second half of verse 26, he says, so that He, that is the Father, would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And that is what I want to discuss this morning. That is what I want to preach on this morning. Is that God is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Friends, there is a dilemma that is presented before us in Scripture. And it is this, God is holy. We see it in Isaiah 6. We see it in Leviticus 11. God is holy. We see it in Leviticus 10, Leviticus 9. God is separate from that which is evil and that which is perverse. And God in His holiness cannot have fellowship with darkness. He cannot fellowship with the sinner. He cannot meet the sinner where they are. In fact, we know from Scripture that no man can stand in His presence. Friends, God is holy. We know from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, Moses tells the Israelites, he says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. We're to reverence and fear God. And that reality concerning Him is presented to us in Scripture unapologetically. It's there. But also we find in Scripture it says that God is gracious. That God is kind, abounding in loving kindness. That He forgives sin. That He pardons the sinner. So we have a dilemma. We've got a seeming contradiction in the character of God. Or so it seems to us. For we find that in the Bible it says God cannot forgive the sinner that His burning wrath and anger is against the wicked, yet it says that He has a love for the sinner and forgives sin. How can that be? Concisely put, the answer is in the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, is in the cross of Calvary where the holiness of God was put on display and the mercy of God was put on display where God showed us that God Himself can be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in His Son. God can both punish the sin of His people and pardon them for it because His Son bore it in His body on the tree. That is the beauty and the glory of the Gospel. And that is ultimately what I want to make known this morning to you. How Christ accomplished that redemption for His church. But before I do that, of course, the context of Romans 3, as I said just a brief moment ago, Paul speaking on salvation, specifically the cross of Jesus Christ. Because he says in verse 25, the previous verse, he says, whom God, he is speaking of Jesus here, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. That word propitiate means wrath has been absorbed. The death of Christ was for a specific purpose. It was to absorb the wrath of the Father. He continues, he says, this was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed. God, forgived, or God forgave the sin of the people in the Old Testament before Christ had even come. How could He do that? Because He knew that His Son would come. He had ordained it to happen. And He knew that one day He'd put those sins away once for all. So He could forgive them on credit, we could say. Verse 26 says, For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time. 
So again, he, he, he's being very emphatic in these two verses. He's saying the same thing he just said in verse 25. It's a demonstration of the righteousness of God. He wants the reader to walk away from this passage understanding that reality. Oftentimes, preachers will stand in pulpits even in this very county and talk all about the love and mercy that God has manifested in His Son by sending Him to die for sin, and that certainly is true. But they often forget to make mention of the reality that Christ died also demonstrating to us the righteous wrath of God. That God does not sweep sin under the rug. That God does not forget about sin. That God does not arbitrarily wipe it away. But that there must be punishment. There must be payment. There must be payment for your sin. And that's why you must embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 4 tells us there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. No other name but the name of Jesus Christ, which clearly speaks to what He came to do. The name Jesus means salvation. Salvation. Romans 10.4 tells us, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. That's why you must believe upon Christ because if you're outside of Christ, God looks upon you at present not, right, not in righteousness. He doesn't look at you as a moral good person. He looks at you as, you're, as you are in your sin because of your law breaking. Because of your lying and your thievery, your blasphemy, and your sexual immorality. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So going back to the text in verse 26, that brings us to the doorstep of the passage I read just a few moments ago concerning God being just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And that is what I want to focus on. So let's look at that. He says, so that He would be just. So the cross of Jesus Christ brought about something, brought about many things, one of which is a display of the righteousness of God, but also the mercy of God. Both at the same time, together, they come, as it were, and kiss and meet and have unison. Because God is not a self-contradicting God. In no way is He like that. God is perfectly unified. Perfectly. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit exists in perfect unity. There is not enmity, as it were, between the attributes of God. As if some are over here on one side that are good and some over here that are bad. And God's just some days this way, some days that way. He's always perfect. He's always righteous. And He's always good. And the cross shows us that. Firstly, it shows us His justice. That God is a just God. That God is a righteous God. We know from Psalm 119, 137 that the psalmist says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. We see that God is right. The word righteous is simply derived from the English word right. That which is not wrong, but which is right according to righteousness. And that is how God deals. That's how He always deals. Because of who He is. And in His righteousness, His wrath is revealed from heaven against the wicked. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So we have here brought before our eyes, set before us, the reality that God is a righteous God and in His righteousness He reveals wrath against the wicked.
But also we find in Scripture that God is gracious and kind. 1 John 4.8 says God is love. And unconverted church members will take that and say, look, I can do as ever I want. Hypocrites will say, yeah, God's gracious so I can live however I want. Such people don't know God. Such people don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's your conception of the mercy of God, you don't know the mercy of God. Because what does Romans 4, uh, 2 tell us? Romans 2, 4 says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? What is God's kindness for? What is God's mercy for? What is God's love for? To lead us to repentance. Not as an excuse to live as however we desire. And sadly, many Southern Baptist preachers will even preach that false gospel. It's not necessarily, certainly the liberals do it way over on the left, but even the guys who call themselves conservative and would say that yes, I hold to the infallibility of Scripture. Those guys also preach oftentimes a false gospel, a man-centered gospel. The gospel is not for that purpose. It is not to make the sinner comfortable in their sin. It is not, as it were, a flu shot that you get and you're good. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah 2.9 It is all of the Lord. Salvation is the supernatural work of God whereby He raises a dead sinner to spiritual life in His Son. He gives to the sinner eternal life. And you think that they can walk away unchanged? Absolutely not. In fact, if someone says they know Christ and they live just as, as they did before, they never knew Him. Those who are saved by Christ reflect that reality in their lives. Not because salvation is by work, but because they cannot help but live that way. They cannot help but live according to their new nature. Because God has taken away the old nature. He has taken away the old heart. And He has given them a heart of flesh. They no longer love the sin that they once lived in. And they no longer hate the God they once rebelled against. Now they have done, as it were, a 180. Hating the sin they once loved and loving the God they once hated. That is the nature of salvation, friends. Let us return to Romans 3, verse 26. He says, so that He would be just and the justifier. Friends, there is good news for you. You sinners, there is good news for you. God justifies the ungodly. God is in the business of regarding those who are otherwise filthy sinners as righteous on account of the work of His Son. How glorious is that? Listen to what Romans 4 says. Romans 4, 4. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. That is, God regards them as if they lived the life of His Son. Oh friend, oh dear sinner, is this attractive to you? Is this of value to you? Cling to it. Grab hold of eternal life in Christ, lest you perish in the way. For His wrath may soon be kindled. God regards the ungodly as godly because of His Son. And that's what the text says. It says He is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There is exclusivity with salvation, my friends. There is exclusivity with Christ. There is no neutrality with Jesus Christ. 
There is no limbo. There is no middle ground. You are either for Christ or you're against Christ. You're either dead in sin or you're alive to God in Christ Jesus. There is no in-between. And notice the text says the one who has faith in Jesus. The text does not say the one who has faith in Allah or perhaps a false god, a pagan god, a foreign god, or a religious leader like the Pope, or a priest, or a pastor. It does not say his faith is in a man or in his own self. It says his faith is in Christ. What is the nature of salvation? It is looking to Christ. Not looking to Jesus somewhat and looking to yourself for the rest of the way. It is looking to Christ in all His sufficiency, in all His power. Salvation is of the Lord. Friends, this God is the God whom you do not know. Man is not born with a full knowledge, a saving knowledge of God. He is not. Although the light of nature in man and the works of God plainly declare that there is a God, His Word and Spirit only do effectually reveal Him unto us for our salvation. Friends, we need God to give us special revelation. And it is found in the Bible, the Word of God, the inspired Scriptures, the 66 books, Genesis to Revelation, that holy men wrote as they were moved, as they were carried along by the Spirit of God. And these Scriptures testify to the character of God. Nahum chapter 1, which is a small Old Testament prophet. Many people don't know about the book of Nahum. But listen to what Nahum chapter 1 says. Verse 2, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserves wrath for His enemies. So therein do we find the wrath of God, the holiness of God, the justice of God. But listen to this, verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. God is patient with the wicked. He truly is giving them time to repent. And that's why you must embrace Christ, friend. Because time is ticking away. Every moment that passes is a moment closer to your demise. Verse 7 of Nahum 1, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who take refuge in Him. How interesting is it that these attributes of God are placed side by side in this passage, and the prophet does not seek to reconcile them, for in the mind of God they are already reconciled. There is no contradiction, only what we perceive as a contradiction. God is all-powerful, as the text just said. He is great in power. He is the Mighty One of Israel, the Creator of all things, heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. And He has made you, my friend. He has endowed you with the precious gift of life. Life, my friends. Do not throw your life away. Do not waste your life. Do not swim in the sewer of sin, but have salvation in the Son of God. So God is holy, and in His holiness, He has established His statutes, His commands. We know from Psalm 1-2 that the righteous man delights in the law of the Lord, delights in the commands of God. What are God's decrees? What are God's commands that He has given for us? They are His Ten Commandments. You yourselves who are religious perhaps have a general understanding of these commands. For God has said, You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not blaspheme. You shall not worship any other God. These commands are contained in Exodus 20. They are later repeated in the book of Deuteronomy and also in the New Testament. 
God's law is perfect. It reveals to us His statutes. It reveals to us His perfect character. Be attentive to the law of the Lord. Paul tells us in the book of Galatians that the law of God is our tutor that leads us to Christ. It points us to the fact that we cannot be saved by our own efforts. That we cannot be saved by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ alone. God has said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is the character of God revealed to us in His law. That He Himself hates lying because He is not a liar. He hates thievery because He owns all things and has a divine prerogative to command us to not steal. God hates murdering because He's not a murderous God. God hates abortion. God hates abortion because God is not a murderous God. God hates the fact that there are 3,000 babies killed in their mother's womb every day in the United States of America. He hates that. You shall not commit adultery. God hates when, when spouses are unfaithful to one another. Why? Because God is a faithful, covenant-keeping God. But friends, here is the issue. Here is where our problem comes in, is this. It's not in the law of God. It's not in the character of God. It's in our character. It's in our fallenness. Because we cannot keep the law of God. You know this yourself. Your conscience screams at you concerning this reality that you are imperfect. Not only that you are imperfect, but that you are a sinner. I do not seek to sugarcoat the, sh the truth of Scripture. Many of you are slaves to sin and dead in it. God looks upon you in your sin. He sees your lying. He sees the thievery. He sees the pornography addiction. He sees the lustful thoughts. He sees the sin of abortion. He sees your blasphemy. He sees that you worship materialistic items. Especially during this season of the year with Christmas. Black Friday just happened last week. Black Friday was the national holiday for worshiping material possessions. I'm not necessarily against buying things. I buy things all the time. But I don't worship them. But what did we see happen on the news? People trampling one another. Jumping all over one another. Just to get a deal on a TV or a tablet. Or a video game console. What vanity. Vanity of vanities. It will all burn. What a waste. But do you know why they do that, friends? It is because they love their sin. And they worship materialism. This is not just your state, but it is my state by default. I'm not saying these things as if I myself am better than you. Now I know that I am outside of Christ much worse than you. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And thereby, because of our sin, because of our transgression of God's law, because of our living in contradiction to the perfect character of God, what is the just penalty? Just as a murderer here in South Carolina must be punished for having broken the law, what is God's punishment for sin? Well, Jesus talked about it more than He did heaven. And it is a place called hell. It is a place of torment for the ungodly. The place of an unquenchable flame. The place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And my dear friends, I don't want you to go there. That's why I point you to Christ. Because He's the only Savior. He's the only Lord who has the power to save from hell. 
But nonetheless, that is the hard truth. And you must come to grips with it. You must grasp this, friends. That you have sinned against God and that you are on the road to destruction. What did Jesus, our blessed Lord, say? Matthew 7. He said, verse 13, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus said offensive things and people don't like that. Why do you think he was killed, friends? He was so offensive that they killed him. They killed him. Jesus wasn't a lovey-dovey, feminized man. He was a man's man, a broad-shouldered Savior. A strong and mighty Lord in His perfect life. Don't sissify the Lord Jesus Christ. As our society tries to sissify men and make them into little boys, the Lord Jesus stays there. He stands, as it were, as the, as the standard of manhood. And He preached boldly. And in that bold preaching, He made it known that hell awaits the ungodly. And God is just to do so. God would be just to send all of us to hell and not think twice about it. God would be righteous to do so, and if you don't think so, you're prideful. If you don't think so, you have great pride in you. You need to look at yourself. You need to look in the mirror of God's law, my friends. Please, I plead with you to go and to see your sin. But praise be to God that Ephesians 2 says God is rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy, my friends. And because of His great love for His people, He chose them to life. He elected them to life before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1 says, Verse 4, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. God predestined a people unto life before the world was made. And He covenanted with His Son. He commissioned His Son to come and to die for that people. And He agreed. He obeyed. He submitted Himself to that charge from the Father. And so therefore, when the fullness of the times came, Christ Jesus came into the world and fulfilled the law on behalf of the church. He kept God's law on behalf of His people. He obeyed as we ourselves cannot. He submitted Himself unto the Father as we ourselves cannot. Friends, Dear friends, I say that because I care for you. Listen to this. Christ has fulfilled the law for His people. No longer do we have to wallow in sin, as it were. Wallow in our hopelessness. Christ gives hope. We know that in Matthew 1.21, the angel told Joseph, He said, You shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sin. Friends, Christ obeyed as we could not. Think about that. Every moment of His life, He lived in perfect submission to the will of the Father. Something that you and I could not do even for a split second. Think about your own life. Was there ever a moment in your own life where you kept God's law as He demands of you? Where you obeyed God's law as He charges you to? No. No. But Christ steps in and fully obeys the law of God. Listen to what Matthew 5 says. Verse 17. Jesus says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Matthew 3, or Matthew 3, 17 also tells us, or Matthew 3, 15, excuse me, it says that the Father was pleased in Christ. My friends, 
and then to speak of the peak of Christ's humiliation. See, it was humiliating, my friend. Christ humbled Himself. He set aside His privileges. He veiled His glory. He left the praise of angels, the worship of the heavenly hosts, and He condescended as the Lamb of God to come down and to dwell among men. John 1, 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh friends, He is indeed full of grace and truth. Won't you come to Christ? But you cannot of your own accord. Jesus said in John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is a hard doctrine, my friends. If you do not know Christ, you are dead in sin and unable to react to spiritual stimuli. You are unable to hear the voice of God calling out, as it were, because you're dead in sin. What must first happen is the Spirit of God must raise you to spiritual life, enable you to come to Christ for Jesus said, no man can come to the Father unless He first draws Him. Or no man can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws Him. And so Christ humbles Himself and He dies upon the cross. He is beat. He is spat upon. He's made a public mockery. Even his own disciples, out of fear, ran away the night before his crucifixion. And even as he was in the garden praying, he sweat drops of blood, which is actually a rare medical phenomenon where you're in such stress and such agony of soul that your sweat glands produce blood. It, why is that? Why did Jesus pray in such agony in the garden? I mean, you think about it. The cross was a bad way to die, but it, all His disciples died the same way. All 11 except for John died martyr's death. In fact, Peter, we know from church history, was nailed upside down to a cross. So it was worse than Jesus. And we know that the martyrs, we know also for, after the Protestant Reformation in England, men and women of renown were burned at the stake. We know John, John, not, not, uh, not John Knox, um, John Rogers was, born at, uh, was burned at the stake as well. Many godly men and women, and they, they took it with joy. They were singing hymns of praise to God as the flames were engulfing their flesh. So how could it be that Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was in such agony? It is because not only did He suffer in body, but in soul. He suffered in His soul. We know from Isaiah 53 that God says that He suffered in His soul. Thank you guys very much. God bless you guys. Thank you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Isaiah 53 says in verse 11, As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Christ was in such agony before he suffered upon the cross because he knew that he was about to bear the infinite wrath of the Father against the sin of the elect. He knew that the wrath of God was about to be poured out upon him. Something that no one has ever borne upon themselves in such a manner as that. And so therefore he cried out upon the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But friends, Christ died victorious because He cried out, It is finished. The wrath of God is absorbed. The wrath of God is taken away. The sin of the people of God is paid for. Salvation is accomplished. Three days later, Christ was raised from the dead. We know from Romans chapter 4, in verse 25 of Romans 4, it says, He was delivered over because of our transgression. 
because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Christ Jesus was raised to show us that the Father had accepted His sacrifice. That salvation was accomplished. So Jesus Christ is alive today and forevermore. Praise be to God. And not only that, but after 40 days of various appearances amongst His disciples, Christ Jesus went to the top of the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem and bodily ascended into glory. And we know from Hebrews 1.3, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. He sat down at the right hand of the Father, exalted in glory. So therefore, let no man think that he can come to God because of his own work. It is a slap in the face to the Son of God. It is a great dishonor to the Lord Jesus Christ to think that you being evil can justify yourself by your own work. The work of Jesus Christ is sufficient. In fact, 500 years ago, an amazing event happened. The beginning of the Protestant Reformation where the reformer Martin Luther pinned the 95 Theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, and thus sparked the Protestant Reformation, which was a group of men and women who stood for the truth of the gospel and left the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church teaches heresy. 500 years ago, my friends, and one of the, one of the bulwarks of the Reformation. One of the slogans of the Reformation was Solus Christus. That is a Latin phrase. It means Christ alone. We are saved by Christ alone, not Jesus plus me or Christ plus my religious performance, but Christ alone, not Christ plus your church attendance, but Christ alone. Therefore, the proper reaction is to repent and believe the gospel, as Jesus said in Mark chapter 1. To repent is to turn from sin, to be broken and see that one has lived a life of rebellion and resolve to flee from it. And then faith or belief in Christ is simply taking God at His word, believing His promises. As we know from Romans 4.3, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as, right, as righteousness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm. But repentance and faith are not things that you can conjure up in yourselves, no. They are gifts from God. Repentance and faith are divine gifts from God that God grants the sinner. So truly you cannot come unless God draws you. But nonetheless, you are responsible. So repent and believe. And God will forgive you of all sin, past, present, future, on account of the work of His Son. And He will credit you with having lived Christ's life. That is, He will regard you as if you're as perfectly righteous as His Son. Which is glorious! That's why Philippians 3, Paul says in his own personal testimony, And that I may be found in Him, verse 9, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. God gives to the sinner a righteousness that is not their own, namely Christ's righteousness. Not only did Jesus die for His people, but He lived for them. He kept the law for them so that God, yes, could forgive them on account of His death, but that also He could treat them as righteous on account of His life. Grace, my friends, all of grace. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is all by grace, all by unmerited favor, not by works of the law. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm. But friends, I want to address a very pressing issue concerning salvation. And I spoke on it earlier, but I want to stress it again. 
If you have not been born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. I care not whether you attend church. I care not whether you read your Bible and pray. You must be born again. Friends, and you may ask, how do I know that I have been born again? Well, Scripture gives some evidences that we might know. See, friends, many people say they know Christ. Many people name the name of Jesus, but they're going to hell. Jesus said that in Matthew 7, and I'll consider that before I get into the details on the fruit of conversion. Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You mean to tell me that there will be people who know that Jesus is Lord and call him Lord and did certain things? for Him, and yet they will be cast out of the kingdom? Or I should say they will never be granted entrance into it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Paul says there are those who profess a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And many of you who sit in churches in this very county, whether you go to a Church of God church, or a Lutheran church, or a Southern Baptist church, or Presbyterian church, if your life has not been radically changed by the power of the gospel, don't think yourself to be a Christian and surely do not call yourself one. If you, my friend, think that you are converted but you care nothing of holiness, nothing of the things of God, nothing of the Word of God or a prayer, friends, do not delude yourselves. I myself, I was raised Southern Baptist, but I was unconverted for seven years. I thought I was saved. I had prayed the prayer, asked Jesus into my heart, which is never in the Bible. Never are we commanded to ask Jesus in our hearts, friends. The command is to repent and believe the gospel. Friends, many people in churches are on the road to destruction. Many pastors, the road to hell is lined with pastor skulls. Friends, you must understand this reality. You can be religious, you can play the game, you can have the outward tradition, the outward trappings of religion. The inward reality must be in your life. And how do you know? Do you love the Word of God? Do you love the Word of God? I didn't say, did you read the Word of God? Because you can read it and hate it. But do you love it? Is, your, is it your delight? What does Psalm 1 say? The righteous man delights in the law of the Lord. And he meditates on it day and night. Do you love prayer? Prayer is the language, as it were, of the born-again believer. They cannot help but breathe prayers to God. Do you love holiness? Do you pursue holiness? Scripture says, There is a holiness without which no man shall see God. Friends, dear friends, I say that because I love you and care for you enough to say this. The, friend, the one who loves you the most will tell you the truth. I'm going to wound you with the truth, friends, but it's for your benefit. Listen, friends, listen to this. Jesus himself said what? What do you say in verse 15 of Matthew 7? Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. He didn't say you'll know them by whether or not they've done some ritual. He says you'll know them by their fruits. How do they talk? How do they live? How do they think? What do you think about most, friends? What do you think about most? What does your eye, what does your mind meditate upon day and night? Is it the law of God or is it how you can sin? Are you always trying to invent new ways to sin or to glorify God? That's how you know whether you've been born again. It's not by works. I'm not saying that. Salvation is all of grace, as I have said emphatically over and over this morning. It's of grace, grace, grace. But what does grace produce? What does God's grace produce? It produces change. I could tell my wife, if I was married, I could tell my wife that I loved her. But if I went around town 
committing adultery with every woman. I would not love her. I'd be a liar. I could say it all I want. I could be emphatic. I could cry. I could tell her with tears I love her. But my actions tell her where my heart truly is. My actions show her whether I'm telling the truth or not. How much more Christ there are many who say they have been wedded to Christ. There are many who say they are a part of the bride of Christ, yet they commit spiritual adultery. Let all who name the name of Jesus Christ depart from evil. It is not perfection, but a new direction of life. Christians sin. Christians fall into sin. Sometimes even grievously. But the difference between a child of God and a hypocrite is a child of God will always return back. They will always, God will not let them go. Hebrews 12 tells us God disciplines His children. If you're without uh, discipline, you're an illegitimate son. That is the true nature of conversion. So my dear friends, if you see that you are not converted, come to Christ, embrace Christ. Repent and believe the gospel of Christ. If you are converted, praise be to God. If you do know Christ, if you are a believer, glory to God. The gospel is not only for the lost, but for the child of God to meditate upon, to feed upon as their daily bread from heaven, to rest in, to rest upon. Friends, if you're a Christian, the gospel is for you to recall to yourself daily, to preach to your own heart. For it ought to be your delight. It ought to be your delight, brethren. It is all by grace. Grace, grace, grace. John 1 says, For all of all His fullness, for of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. And what is the purpose of salvation? What is the chief end? What is the purpose of all things? Why did God make this world? Why did God ordain sin's entrance into it? Why did He allow Adam and Eve in the garden to fall? Why did He ordained for His Son to come and to die and to rise again and one day to return to judge the living and the dead. What's the purpose of it all? Many people often live their entire life with no purpose. They never live with purpose. But friends, I want to tell you, the purpose of all things, the point of this entire creation that God has wonderfully made is His own glory. All things have been made for the glory of God. We know from Psalm 19, all the heavens are telling the glory of God. We know that salvation is all to the glory of God. It's all that He might receive the praise and the honor in all things, especially in salvation, because it is all of grace. God is jealous, my friends, jealous to receive the glory to Himself in the salvation of sinners. We find that Paul in Romans 11 after having thoroughly treated the issue of salvation, having thoroughly explained God's sovereignty over salvation, says this in verse 33, For who are, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments, and unfathomable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who is first given to him, that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen and amen. Indeed, to God be all glory in all things forever. A brief exhortation again to you who do not know Christ. My plea with you is to come, is to abandon your beloved sin, to abandon your love of the things that God hates, to abandon watching things on television that God detests, 
To abandon speaking in a way which you know God does not approve of. To abandon your sexual morality, your fornication. To abandon your drunkenness and your drug abuse. To abandon your love of this present world. To abandon these things. To abandon your lying and your thievery. And to run to Christ. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. And you who say that you know Christ, you religious people, I encourage you as I did earlier to examine your lives, to see whether you have a love for holiness, a love for the things of God, a love for the Word of God and for prayer, a love to, to fellowship with the saints and to hear the Word of God preached, a love to obey God. Do you love these things? Are they your delight? Or are you simply self-deluded? Deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending your life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Then you religious hypocrites, Christ bids you, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or for those of you who are confident of your conversion, who have seen the grace of God in your own life manifested, that you are a new creation, then praise be to God. Blessed be the God of salvation for having saved you. Now glorify and praise and honor Him who lives forevermore. Delight in His gospel. Preach to your own heart the gospel. For you need it daily, brethren. You need it daily. Do not depart from the gospel. My brethren, please, not only that, but you must publish this gospel. Proclaim this gospel. Share it with your unconverted family members. Challenge them. Plead with them. You may wound them with the truth, but it is in love. And if you love them, you must tell them the truth. Friends, the one who loves you enough will wound you with the truth rather than comfort you with lies. What do you care about more, their present feelings or their eternal state? Let us care for the souls of men and not merely whether they've been offended or not. We live in a really offended culture. It's okay to be offended at everything. It's okay to be triggered at everything. It's okay to act like you're a little baby. But friends, that's not reality. The Bible steps on emotion. The Bible is bold. And the preaching of the gospel certainly is offensive. In fact, what does it say in 1 Corinthians 18? For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It is foolishness to those who are perishing. So in Romans, so we have seen here in Romans chapter 3. In verse 26, that God, in the economy of salvation, is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He is both holy and righteous, gracious and wrathful. How can that be? Because of the cross of Christ. And we have seen that. that yes, God is holy. We deserve hell for our sin. But God, being rich in mercy, sent His Son to die for sinners and was raised on the third day. And all who come to Him will be saved by His grace and for His glory. So to the Lord Jesus Christ, be all glory, honor and praise in all things as they redound to His glory forevermore. Amen and amen.